Good afternoon. On behalf of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, it is my pleasure to welcome today's guests and our audience to this afternoon's webinar on white supremacy, policing, and Asian massage work. We gather still in outrage and grief that the killing of eight people in Atlanta targeted around Asian massage work is what has brought us together today. As we continue to mourn the loss of life in this brutal act of white supremacist, misogynist, anti-immigrant and anti-sex work terror, we also seek to understand the systemic injustices that have caused Asian massage workers to be the targets of state and interpersonal violence for decades. The hypersexualization of Asian women originating in US military conquest throughout Southeast Asia has been well documented. However, in recent years, the anti-trafficking movement has distorted the impacts of such hypersexualization to endorse a new set of humanitarian violence enacted on working class Asian women around the world. In the past decade, Asian massage work has become a target of anti-trafficking organizations who see quote unquote, illicit massage businesses as locusts of human trafficking. Nearly all of these interventions have called for the heightened surveillance and policing of massage businesses, which has resulted in hundreds of raids across the country. Right here in Providence, Rhode Island in 2016, Governor Gina Raimondo passed a law that introduced a new category of Asian body work, requiring a distinct license from that of a massage therapist. In order to receive such licenses, these laws prevalent in over a hundred uh, dozens of states across North America require Asian body workers to submit to criminal background checks, citizenship requirements, English language tests, high school diplomas, and exorbitantly costly technical certificates. The municipal ordinance instigating this law in Providence specifically sought to target Asian massage businesses following what was called Operation Rubdown first initiated in 2003, aimed at cracking down on Asian massage businesses, which according to our research with Coyote Rhode Island has resulted in the closing of hundreds of Asian massage businesses in the past two decades. This is the racist legal regime that subjects workers in New York City and Toronto and Atlanta to pervasive fear, surveillance and violence as we will learn from our guests today, organizers and workers with Red Canary Song and the Butterfly Project. As a closing to my welcome remarks, I wanna suggest that what's particularly absent from current discussions is how systems of white supremacist violence are equally rooted in their benevolent counterpart, white saviorhood. For far too long, the anti-trafficking movement has allowed rescue organizations to speak for the victimization of migrant Asian communities, amassing millions of dollars in funding to perpetuate the surveillance and policing of our communities. For her lessons on the links between the myriad virulent forms of the global white supremacy, I'm particularly grateful to introduce my co-moderator, Kamala Kempadu, who will then introduce our panelists. We will proceed with a conversation and then open the discussion up to Q&A and encourage each of you to use the chat function. For those of you who are joining and needing Mandarin or Korean interpretation, please click on that appropriate button at the bottom um, of the Zoom panel. Kamala Kempadu is professor of social science at York University in Canada and the 2021 COGIT visiting professor at Brown University. She teaches in the areas of black radical and black feminist thought, Caribbean studies, sex work studies and critical anti-trafficking studies and is author and editor of numerous publications on the Caribbean and global sex trade, including the book, Global Sex Workers, Rights, Resistance and Redefinition. We are currently co-editing a collection together on racism, coloniality, and anti-trafficking. Thanks for joining us, Kamala. Well, thanks for inviting me. Even though this is a very tragic and very sad moment, I'm very pleased to be part of this conversation and um, with um, Butterfly that I know very well uh, from Toronto and have worked closely with, um, and with uh, and with Red Canary Song that I've heard so much about. Um, 
welcome everyone. Um, thank you, Elena, for that really important introduction to what we are going to be talking about today. Um, I will just introduce um, the speakers, not necessarily in the order that they'll be uh, uh, speaking, but uh, as I have them in front of me. Esther Gao is organizer with Red Canary Song and consultant at the Sex Workers uh, Project. Yves Tong Nguyen is a queer and disabled Viet um, cultural worker and sex worker whose organizing home is with Survived and Punished New York, Red Canary Song, and Free Them All for Public Health. Um, Wu is Chinese American, uh, New York City based, sex worker and cultural producer. They organize events and exhibitions as part of Red Canary Song, um, Kink Out events and Veil Machine. Welcome Wu. And Elaine Lam is the executive director of Butterfly, Asian and Migrant Sex Workers Support Network in Toronto. She has in, been involved in sex workers, labor, migrant, gender, and racial justice movements for over 20 years. She is a PhD candidate at McMaster University in Canada. Welcome all of you, and thank you very much for participating in this um, event that we've organized, or Elena has organized so quickly and so efficiently um, in this short space of time. It is important for us to have this conversation through Brown as well, because I know that students also at uh, the university are also needing to hear from us and to um, understand and have a good grasp of what has been um, taking place recently um, in the US. But I, I see we've also got several international participants as well with us here. So welcome everyone to this session. Um, to start off with, because I don't want to take up time myself, we have a few questions for our uh, panelists and Elena and I will alternate in, in asking these questions. So in terms of um, the first one, to warm us up and to tell us a little bit about your work for Elaine and Wu. Can you please tell us the origin stories for your organizations? How did you first begin doing this work? How did you get involved in this um, support work for um, Asian and migrant sex workers and massage workers? Elaine would like to start off and then Wu or I'm not sure. Elaine? Okay, hi everyone. So I am Elaine. So um, thank you for organizing this important event. So I think um, this um, killing really uh, bring a lot of long-term problem issue what Asian and the people in massage parlor and sex industry is facing. So now have so many like anti-racism movement going on. So before I go to introduce Butterfly, I think we need to acknowledge that the killing is not only related to racism, but this is related to massage parlor and also how the whole phobic, whole phobia um, is, is a contributing factor. And I think this panel is so important make us do not remember this part, yeah. So yeah, Butterfly is an Asian and migrant sex worker support network. Uh, we're based in Toronto, but we also uh, connect with the worker in different city. So um, the small story is like um, uh, Butterfly was found like um, six year already. We will have an anniversary celebration uh, next month. So this is still a small grassroots organization. The main reason Butterfly was found is because um, I was involved in the sex worker movement also when I was in Asia. So when I moved to Canada, we found that the sex worker movement is so strong and powerful, but mainly is led by the uh, white sex worker. And I met the, some of the Asian and migrant sex worker I knew when I was in Hong Kong and then like some 
folks is like, why don't we organize a, a organization that can support uh, each other, particularly at that time when there is the legal challenge uh, of the criminal law in Canada, the police race seems um, not happening. But it's not true. This is still continues happening to raid the massage parlor and raid the sex worker place, a particular for um, Asian. So that's why it's the, having the need to have the platform to connect with the community and also advocate uh, for the right. Thank you. That's nice and gives us a, a good little introduction. I know you've got a lot more to say. And we'll turn to Wu. Thank you, Wu. Hi, thank you both so much. Um, thank you, Kamala, for the introduction. And also thank you, Elaine, for sharing about Butterfly. I wanted to give a quick uh, visual description of myself for those who are visually impaired. I have long black hair. I'm an East Asian presenting person. I have um, I'm wearing cat eye glasses and I'm wearing a black tank top. Um, but yeah, Red Canary Song is, um, is an organization that is based in New York. It's a grassroots collective of Asian American or Asian sex workers and also allies. Um, as well as massage workers um, organizing for uh, massage workers based in New York. So um, I believe that Red Canary Song began in 2017 after the death of a massage worker whose name was Song Yang and she was based in Flushing and she fell to her death out of a two-story window um, after like several days, possibly weeks of exploitation from police. And so, um, there was a visual that was held in her honor and um, other massage workers communicated with other organizers in New York um, talking about how they wanted to form like a massage union and so that was essentially how they wanted to form a union for massage um, workers especially migrant massage workers and I think that that was the beginning of um, Red Canary Song forming and it has since grown from there to being um, to, you know, uh, creating community for Asian American and Asian sex workers um, who are based in New York, as well as being in coalition with other sex working organizations, as well as um, engaging with like outreach services, legal aid, know your rights training and other um, mutual aid um, with other massage workers. I personally came into Red Canary Song in just about two years ago in 2019 when um, I attended a DCRIM NY meeting um, which is uh, a coalition based group for um, decriminalization of sex work in New York. And I saw Kate Zen speak and I had moved to New York less than a year prior. Um, and it was the first time that I'd ever seen another, I think it was the first time I'd ever met another Asian sex worker. And there was something that like clicked inside of me and um, the way that she spoke was incredibly moving. And I approached her after that meeting and um, and the rest is history. Uh, yeah, now I believe that we operate with about like five to 10 core members, um, as well as in coalition with other organizations um, and other like rotating satellite organizers, so. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Elaine, you want to jump in here, yeah. Um, Elena. It's been so clear that uh, Asian massage workers are subject to so many different kinds of constraints. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about um, the different kinds of barriers that the workers you work with face. Um, and in particular, maybe how your organizations each work to combat police violence. What are you finding particularly difficult about your work and where, um, where do you need some, some help from the community? Uh, we can start with uh, Elaine maybe and then move to Eves. Yeah, so I think um, the people working in massage parlor is facing a lot of different layer. And I think as you mentioned at the very beginning, um, the regulation of massage surface is very racist. It's based on like, um, no matter how they regulate, is still they require English skills, they need very expensive um, course that you can go to the school so that all this kind of measure is ex actually excluding the Asian, even like massage is like amazing, like Asian um, technique for many Asian countries, right? So, and I think, and the wisdom and the knowledge, so, but in Northern America, they are being appropriate and then um, the people will, with the knowledge and with the skills and then they are not able to use it. And they also use it as the way to criminalize 
uh, that they can uh, arrest the people or they can um, find the people, surveillance the people. So um, we based in Toronto. So in Toronto um, is um, uh, mostly if you want to be the massage therapist, you need to go to um, Ontario that, as I said, you need to pay a lot of money. So they have created a category called holistic center. So that is like the main reason is not for Asian is because there are some also white um, non like massage practitioners. So they advocate for that. So, but that's get a little bit room. Many uh, Asian workers is uh, registered under that category. Now has over 2000 people have that category, but the um, racial profiling, um, the policing against them has never stopped. The, the bylaw written in the way is very, very problematic. So, um, so for example, um, the holistic center, so there is a lot of policy that they cannot lock the door. Um, there is not allow them to, uh, uh, the, the opening hour is being uh, 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 monitored, but because they are not perceived as sexual, that the regulation is less uh, restrictive than body rock parlor. They are being seen as like more related erotic and sexual. Like uh, for example, in Toronto, they only allow 25 lights, uh, 25 license. And then it's like the cost is like over $13,000 in order to get the license. And they have so strict regulation that, that even the staff, you cannot take the money from the client. It's like all crazy regulation. But because this regulation, they give extensive power for the law enforcement, including police and by law enforcement officer keep coming in, coming in that um, to investigate the people and find the people and also um, make the people um, uh, discriminate the people and a lot of racial profiling. We, we also see other like white uh, sex worker or massage parlor worker operate. They do not ex experience so same level of policing. And then they will come in to find different excuse to give you tickets, for example, a little bit crack on your massage bag, or, or your, you have the rubbish in the rubbish bin, also say your, your, your place is not clean. And more ridiculous is they ask the people to take off the clothes to show their underwear. If they sexy, they will say you have unprofessional clothing and give them tickets. So that has been happening for so many years. And then the, the racism payout is so powerful, but because the law make it invisible, right? Because the, the law enforcement just come in and say, oh, now I'm not racial profiling. I'm just trying to investigate some illegal activity or non-compliance, you know, like that is become the excuse. And, 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 and so, but, uh, and also there is big piece why the law enforcement do it is because the anti-sex worker organization, religion organization, um, they are organized to lobby the city, lobby the government to have this restrictive policy, excessive investigation to say they rescue the woman, right? But that's this all they are using the assumption Asian and naive, they don't have language, that they are the victim, and then encourage the law enforcement to come together. But indeed, we, we know very well, massage is very powerful resistant for many migrant women, Asian racialized people to resist all kind of oppression. They can use massage to gain so much uh, social connection. They can so gain so much economic power. They can use it to have their career advancement, so many benefits. But all this thing that is not allowed to happen. So, so that's that is what happening. And last few years, Butterfly do very hard to organize the worker by um, providing the information, translating all the bylaw and having the collective action. And Kamala also <laughs> have joined our action in City Hall. We have mobilized like 300 workers and allies went to City Hall to advocate for the rights do not want the massage power being shut down. But ridiculously, there is like few white uh, anti-sex worker organization, anti-trafficking organization, their voice is much louder. Even that we can see whole city recommendations, city policy is listen to them, not listen to us. Even we have workers say loud in city hall, I'm not the traffic worker, I need this job. And then that white saver will say, oh, you're too victimized. You're too naive, you don't know you're the victim. Let me save you, right? So, and that, I think this whole thing is so problematic. Maybe later can, can share more, but I think uh, this is this is very challenging by combat um, policing, 
uh, organize the worker is a very, very important piece. And the other piece, we do build a lot of allyship because we know that, like the politician, the society will not listen to the community. So that's why we also need like the advocates, like human rights advocates, academic and also labor organization to come together to uh, support us together. So thank you. So yeah, thank you, Elaine. I think that Elaine covers a lot of ground in talking about what massage workers are currently going through and the violence that they're subjected to while working in massage businesses. And in a part of talking about that, I kind of want to, like when we're talking about police violence, right? It becomes a little bit amorphous, but I wanna like have specificity around like what that violence is because often a lot of people think of police violence as simply like when police injure or kill people, which they absolutely do to people who work in massage businesses. They definitely do to massage workers, but like police violence also looks like the way in which they have raided businesses, the ways in which they lead to people's arrest, the ways in which they lead to deportation, which all of these things, right? Arresting people and incarcerating people at the end of the day is still a death sentence. We know that so many people die while being incarcerated. We know so many people die in the process of deportation. And that is also violence and all of these other forms. And it's not just the police, which Elaine also talks about, right? that we're also dealing with social services, we're also dealing with anti-sex work, anti-trafficking organizations that have a really big voice and have a lot of funding, right? And so when you're looking at police violence, it extends beyond PD and it extends beyond ICE as well. And I think in terms of talking about combating it and also what massage workers are going through, there are two parts, right? Is that what I consider like narratively and discourse wise and also coalition building and how we tackle narratives around the police, especially as they change over time and they adapt and all of their techniques have adapted over time that Aline also talks about as like obscuring the nature of what they're doing. And they say that they're not racial profiling and that this isn't racially motivated violence, right? But we know that that's not true because we know that the police are tools of white supremacy. But they hide that and they adapt over time. And with that, we also have to adapt the methods in which we talk about them and address like the roots of violence that come from the police. Because, you know, they're not just arresting people now and charging them with prostitution, right? Now that they've come under fire for charges like these, because there are a lot of massage businesses where people don't engage in sex work or that we don't even know, right? They will now charge people with issues of licensure while also having all of these barriers of entry that Aline talks about and that other people have talked about that it's really hard to get a proper license because there are huge language barriers. They don't offer these tests in English. They don't offer any of these things. And it's really hard to get that. And then they'll go in and arrest people at the same time for not having proper license. But we know that that's not the reason, right? It's not because they're not operating without a license. It's because they're criminalized. It's because of the criminalization of sex work. It's because they're criminalized as undocumented immigrants, right? And so we're also tackling the way that they talk about these things, the way that they talk about massage workers, the way that they talk about Asian migrant women and the narratives that they sell. And also the modern narratives around anti-trafficking and the modern narratives around the police, because they did not always say that they were trying to keep us safe or that they were trying to keep Asian migrant women safe or that they wanted to save them or rescue them. There are a lot of points in history that will tell you that the police, that ICE, that all of these different like carceral people used to be very blatant about hating immigrants, used to be very blatant about hating sex work, used to be very blatant about their anti-Blackness, right? And so it's only very recently and in modern history that we see people shifting the narrative to say that they wanna save people, that they have public safety and we have to push against that. And then the other part of carcerality is that as we especially see here in the US because of the utter failure to deal with COVID-19, right? As social safety nets fall away, you see the expansion of carcerality. They say that all of these like carceral people, the police, these social services that eventually also lead to 
punitive measures and policing are expanded and they say that they can do all of these social services and all of these safety net. So our job partially, right, and what massage workers have done for a long time for each other is be the social safety net, is provide people with the things that they need so that they're not having to like turn to the police or these social services that are going to turn them over or deport them, right? Which is why we do the mutual aid work, which is why we provide money, which is why we provide groceries, which is like the other part of the work that I think separate the like narrative work. It's, thank you, thank you, Eve. It's really important to hear how similar the situations are between Canada and, and, and the United States. Um, often we think as in two quite separate places and, um, and the circumstances quite different, but they aren't. And, and in these instances, they're very, very similar. So thank you both for sharing that. Um, Eve, you raised an important issue, right? Which I, I'm going to turn to Elena, Elaine to uh, perhaps talk a little bit more about um, under COVID and what has been going on and um, you're, you're suggesting that the sort of policing and so forth has been intensified. But I understand Elaine, uh, Elaine you've been, um, you did re a recent research or some, uh, you produced a re recent report about the experiences of migrant massage workers under COVID-19. Um, could you perhaps share a bit of that? of what your findings were and how that, you know, also speaks to some of the issues about, around policing that we're talking about. Yeah, and I think that actually COVID reflect the crack of the social system, right? So, and like Eve said, sex worker and people in massage parlor is facing the oppression from the law, including the bylaw, criminal law, and immigration law. That is something is already make them vulnerable like marginalized every day, but the COVID um, that uh, even the government have like different kind of income support, social support, but they are still excluded, right? Um, for migrant sex worker because of the precarious uh, immigration status, they are not able to access like any uh, government funding. So even some people may have immigration status, but the criminal law is the huge barrier that the people are afraid uh, any kind of filing tax will trigger the criminal investigation, right? And then how they can report the taxes is a huge challenge, not mention about like whole um, language barrier. And so assessing how social service already is the huge barrier, but because of the anti-trafficking uh, movement going on, so many sex worker support program, community support program become an anti-trafficking program. So instead of go to the place that people ask you, do you need shoes, do you need food? They often need to do a lot of intake, like very detailed information about like, what do you need, uh, who are you working with? Like all this surveillance actually push the sex worker away and push the people working in massage parlor away. So, and also that no income support. So even massage is the legitimate business, but many of them is still not able to get like um, the government business fund because it's like um, the, the criteria is not benefited to the small informal business. If the people is work in brothel or like the indoor place, they are not sex work not being recognized. Of course, they are not able to get like any business funding, even this is an important business, right? And the policing have not stopped. The policing have and even increased, particularly with all this emergency order. So for example, in Ontario, they passed the uh, emergency law that the police have power to get um, the, the to, to check the ID. So that have not happened before. Suppose, suppose the police do not have that power to do so, but they're the legitimate that. And the police also can run the data of the um, people uh, um, COVID, um, Data. So it's also the um, research found out from uh, Freedom of Information uh, found out from the human rights organization. They see how extensively um, the police abuse the system is chasing all the data. And the policing is like, um, for example, we have one massage parlor because her family member have um, COVID. Um, uh, she feel um, uh, she don't feel well, so that she try to isolate herself from her like old parents. But she, when she work in when she stay in massage parlor, if she's not working, she got like five tickets in two days. The fine is like over 
um, ten thousand dollars. So, and this is ridiculous. And recently, there is a little bit reopening. Then all the business need to develop a kind of like um, safety plan because of the language barrier. The people may not um, able to provide the document with what they need. And then like over time, massage parlor get the ticket in a few days. So it's like the police, all this kind of policy, whatever policy can is still used to target them. And, and so that's why in our, our report, we uh, have interview, um, we have done the survey and with the worker to see how they are affected. We also have uh, uh, some discussion and then we have very clear recommendation of course, decriminalization of sex work, um, eliminated the discrimination and status for all. So those are very, very important um, measure to uh, support the people during COVID, but also to, to feel the crack of the social system and, and make sex worker and massage parlor worker being respect and they can, uh, entitled and enjoy the rights right so and i think this is um uh we don't know how long it lasts but this is not only happening covid i think we need to know that this is happen every day but covid just make the situation uh, more worse yeah thank you. it intensifies it thank you thank you and perhaps we can bring esther in to the conversation just um to speak a little bit about how red canary song um has been able to um, has been working during the pandemic, pandemic, and um, working to alleviate some of the economic strains um, and uh, stress that massage parlor workers uh, are facing. Could you speak to that a little bit, Esther? Yeah, definitely. Um, and Eves can feel free to jump in if I ever uh, if I miss anything. Um, so since the pandemic has started, um, we've been doing a lot of mutual aid work. Um, for the massage workers that we do outreach to. So honestly, it's just, you know, providing the basic necessities that the government should have been doing in the first place, right? So um, uh, helping them pay their rent, um, you know, doing grocery uh, drops um, when, when it's needed and doing it consistently to, to build trust um, and show that, you know, RCS is a, um, a resource for them and that there's no um, exchange involved um, in an environment that's, you know, highly, um, highly under stress at the moment. Um, and uh, we uh, don't do cash drops anymore, but uh, early on, earlier on in, during the pandemic, uh, we did because cash aid was uh, very necessary. Do you want to add something, anything in there? I think Esther covered it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Elena. Yes, I want to take moderators um, privilege and just add one thing that I think is really important, which is that migrant massage workers, even those who were documented, were terribly fearful of accessing unemployment benefits during COVID-19 um, due to Trump's public charge law, which um, threatened status or regularization of status for people who were shown to be burdens on the system. So of course, undocumented people could not access those at all. We certainly provided mutual aid there, but also funnel, uh, redirected them to the scarce mutual aid resources that existed for undocumented people. But across the board as an industry, um, low wage migrant workers are fearful of applying for public assistance. Um, and this has led to the increase of really, really predatory intermediary agencies that have stepped in to do everything from file taxes to offer them fake licenses. Um, and this has been an extraordinary strain on that community. Um, want to shift a little bit because there's been very curious conversations surrounding these killings about faith and the underpinnings of Christianity as it's tied to this killer, to white supremacist violence, but also as we've seen um, evangelical Christianity has deep roots in promoting anti-trafficking. And I want to turn it over to Esther specifically to comment on some of the entanglements of um, religion and what we've seen last Tuesday. Yeah, um, I can definitely talk more about that. And this question is um, deeply personal to me too, since I grew up in a very conservative evangelical household and even went to <laughs> a evangelical college. So um, all of this is very familiar rhetoric. Um, 
And there's a long history of Christians imposing violence upon Asian women under the guise of good intention, right? But before we can really get into that, uh, we need to briefly understand the policies that created those conditions. Um, the Page Act of 1875 banned Chinese women from entering the United States who were considered prostitutes and led to the very beginnings of targeting Chinese brothels in Chinatowns. Um, even though prostitution uh, was uh, equally prevalent among other nationalities, right? Um, and um, at the time, the American Medical Association even stated that Chinese immigrants have, quote, distinct germs, uh, especially prostitutes. And I think some alarm bells um, around that language and rhetoric should um, be ringing since uh, there's a lot, uh, since COVID happened, right? The China virus or a kind of specific public health concern around um, Asian bodies has reemerged. Um, uh, the Page Act then led to the Chinese Exclusion Act and created the um, policing of immigrants around sexuality, which continues today. Um, and all of these you know, intersections of immigration, policing, public health, and state violence parallels so closely with what happened last week. And Christians come in um, around the same time. So in New York City and San Fran during the Progressive Era, why suffragettes uh, found it their mission to rescue these Chinese sex slaves and uh, civilizing them. And Chinese women had to be controlled as quote, perpetual prostitutes and cures of disease. And a great example of this is uh, this uh, pretty glorified white savior, uh, Donaldina Cameron, who was uh, a missionary who wanted to rescue and fix the Chinese slave problem at the time. And another example is Rose Livingston, who um, actually lied about rescuing prostitutes in Chinatown while campaigning across the country for um, actually women's right to vote, um, which would quote, clean the city of prostitution um, because there was sort of um, no conception that women would actually want to um, be engaged in sex work if you know, other conditions align, right? And there was really no class analysis at the time too um, among these uh, pretty privileged white women. And uh, this legacy of like conservative Christian morality continues into today in the anti-trafficking movement and various well-funded anti-trafficking nonprofits often backed by both churches and the state. And these nonprofits organizations often do not work with sex workers and conflate both sex workers with trafficking victims as an attempt to um, er eradicate the sex industry. And we have an entire criminal legal system uh, that is built upon these assumptions and work in tangent with these nonprofits. Um, I just want to like end on like the Atlanta shooting is probably the most crystallized example of this violence, not because it's any different from the violence that massage workers and Asian sex workers have historically experienced, but it's one of the first times that it's done via an individual perpetrator and it's not uh, done through the state. And I just wanna emphasize, if you're angry about the violence last week, you should be angry at the state which has been doing the exact same thing for years. And the motivations are the same, right? To cleanse the city of these dirty immigrant women who are carrying disease and um, doing morally wrong work in, in which in their imagination, uh, no woman could possibly consent to be doing, right? So they must be trafficked. Um, so these dangerous women need to be silenced and have their agency removed, um, even you know, and even if it means to the to the point of death and forceful removal. Um, and it's um, it's uh, you know the influence that both um, the nonprofit industrial complex and the state have when they're working in tangent is so incredibly dangerous to massage workers. And um, I want to like just further emphasize the importance of not further investing in the police as a solution, um, because this would just continue if, if we continue to rely on the same system to, to provide um, aid or attempt to uh, create change. Thank you. Yeah, that's so, so, so important. Um, it is also perhaps a good um, segue into hearing a little bit from Elaine um, about the campaign that you're um, uh, 
um, that you're waging right now, the um, eight calls for justice. Uh, Elaine is going to share the, uh, the um, slide here about that campaign. But Elaine, could you, would you speak to this a little bit? Okay, yeah, and I think, uh, thank you for Eve and Esther, like to talk about what is the issue people in massage color and sex industries facing. And many of the problem is because of the criminalization of sex work. And it's also because of the problem of that, like um, uh, a moralistic value idea about not recognize sex work as work. And so there is so many harm has done against, um, a sex worker in the name of protection, right? The policing when then when the name um, using protection so that they can do whatever harm they do, right? And then when the the anti sex worker organization that they use anti trafficking, anti -sex sexual exploitation, they can cover up their moralistic agenda um, to 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 end the sex industry. So when I hear what the murder said, that um, he is uh, trying to um, like. Uh, eliminate the temptation is no different with the anti-sex worker group they say they want to eliminate the sex industry right they are so violent that they feel they have the power um to control the other people's life or destroy the other people's life so so that's why i think this is the moment we really um we have a lot of sadness we have a lot of anger but i think this is really really want to move move that how we do not want to have it happen right and i think there is a lot of like discussion so whether um uh the the asian women are fetishized and also how this worker is related to sex work so and for butterfly and i also see the people a question in check box for butterfly is this very clear that so not all the people work in massage parlor provide sexual service but we can see the people who work in massage parlor is being harmed by homophobia. They are being harmed by the anti-trafficking law. They are harmed by the anti-trafficking um, movement. They are harmed by the criminalization of sex work. So that's why we put out a call. So this is an eight-day action so that we really hope that you will uh, support because we really want to show the society and the government and the politician that they, they should listen to us. So you see the NGO and the government and the law enforcement they can when, uh, come hand in hand, get so many resources, power, because they have so much people support them. So that's why we really want to have this moment um, to build like more allyship and have more support about um, this movement. So the first thing is the full decriminalization of sex work. We know how how tricky the anti-sex worker organizations say they also support Decriminalization of, sex, decriminalization of sex work car, right? But it's not decriminalization of sex work. So that's why we are asking for full decriminalization of sex work, including client, including uh, any third party, including manager, because they are the important support system for sex worker. And particularly that we also have the experience that like um, the boss uh, being murdered when they try to protect um, their, their worker and also the client is the important support when the uh, uh, sex worker get into the trouble. So, and, and, and that is so important to have full decriminalization of sex work and recognize sex work is work. It's so important to push back the moralistic idea about how the woman body should be controlled and how the sexuality should be controlled. And so, and even there is a lot of discussion about like um, whether Asian women being fetishized that um, they can be used by men. And I think what is powerful, sex work is work is no matter image sex worker being put in, they have the way of control and flip it become the resources and power, right? So people, particularly many Asian community, they think fetishize um, or sexualize our Asian woman is the bad thing, but actually we need to recognize so many Asian sex worker is using that to get the power, economic resources and, and get the control. And, the, and so that's why we keep saying that the, the, the main issue is not fetishized. The main issue is how um, the white supremacy take away the agency and power of the worker. And the other is rights not rescue, uh, sex work is not human trafficking. So this is respond to the um, 
uh, like push back the anti-trafficking movement and fight against racism, no cop as workplace. Just like Esther say, policing is not the solution. We don't need police to, to, to come in because they just, um, they are the ma major source of violence. So, and status for all, so um, Butterfly is a part of migrant rights network so that we are fighting for the status for all, for many people having the immigration status is the best way to uh, avoid exploitation, is the best way to stop the violence and assess without fear policy in the city level so that um, there are some city that have the assess without fear policy that no matter what immigration status, they still can assess social support resources and also assess police uh, support when they need help without fear of being arrested and referred to immigration. But of course, this is not the policy being uh, enforced well. So now we have around like uh, 4,000 signed the petition. We really hope that um, we can like have more and more people support and we have a double, triple of this uh, number um, to show your solidarity and show your support. Um, uh, please help us to share and uh, keep support us and also Red Canary in US um, to advocate for the rights of um, Asian and migrant uh, worker in massage parlor and uh, sex industry. Thank you. Does the Red Canary have a similar um, call or campaign? I know I've see, been seeing some important statements coming out from Red Canary. I don't know if one of you could speak to that rule, perhaps, Eves or Esther? I can answer. So um, Red Canary doesn't currently have a similar call to action, um, and we will probably be uplifting this one. Um, but there are currently calls as very quickly, the New York City, New York governments are pushing for police um, expansion through police reform legislation that really needs to be pushed back on. Today, they are voting in the council for like language access um, bill legislation that would expand the power of the New York Asian Hate Crimes Task Force, which we know expanding the power of the police would only further hurt people. So we really want to ask people to stand against that, to call your council members, specifically Margaret Chin, and to tell them to not do this and that this is not going to help people. And also for them to co-opt a lot of what we've been working on in order to expand the power of the police, right? Using language access as a reason to expand power and to give more funding to the NYPD is completely wrong, right? And then even Bill de Blasio's plan as well as to increase and expand the power of the NYPD by saying that they would take on restorative justice practices, which they could never do and are not welcome to do. Yeah, I just want... Oh, I just want to add that, um, you know, Red Canary did release uh, a statement in response to the shootings. And at the bottom, we have, uh, we highlighted falling demands from the New York based massage workers that um, we're in contact with. And I'll just read them now. Um, there's five points. The first one is pay attention to the life and work safety of massage and salon employees. Two, Asian massage workers and businesses come from the community and give back to the community. Three, the legal working rights of Asian massage workers must be protected. Four, the lives of Asian massage workers must not be lost in vain. And five, the legal profession of massage work should be respected and protected by US society. Fabulous, thank you so much. And those fit really well together with the, the points raised by Elena in this um, call, eight calls for justice. So that's uh, both of both Red Canary Song and Butterfly, I think uh, your campaigns are really, really important to join together as well as you're doing. Thank you. Elena. Thanks, um, Eves. I have learned so much from you as an abolitionist. I'm wondering if you can comment, given recent national conversations around defunding the police, um, what would you offer as ways to bring an abolitionist orientation to this moment, thinking particularly about how people are talking about um, hate crimes legislation and, and things like that. So I think that an abolitionist like orientation is natural, actually, to this work and natural to like 
finding the solutions to the violence that massage workers, Asian migrant workers and sex workers face, right? When we talk about the solutions that Butterfly and we are showing you that is evidence-based, right? In many years of like evidence that decriminalization is the only way that we are ever going to have safety, the only way that we can see forward. And criminalization is, fully rooted in the police, right? Who is doing the criminalizing? The state is, right? So I think that an abolitionist orientation is natural to this work and needs to be included. I think that sometimes it's left out of the conversation for the Asian, Asian American community at large because of like immediate reactions to be like, oh, we want to be recognized, right? We want to be recognized by the state. So we say, oh, you should say that this is a hate crime. But if you actually look at it, right, when you get to the roots of violence, you know that the state is never going to be the people who are, who are going to provide safety, who are going to provide those solutions and certainly not the police as their tools of white supremacy for the state. And so when you look at that, you know that we shouldn't be using their language in order to define our violence, right? Calls to define as hate crimes only expands the power that the police have, gives them more legitimacy, right? In their power. And we say that, oh, they can solve it, but we know that they can't. Like we here know that they can't solve it and that they can't keep people safe and in including that orientation, but also as it occurs to like sex work specifically, right? I often feel that an abolitionist orientation is missing partially because many sex workers don't understand or fully see that decriminalization only occurs under abolition, right? Some people might think that decriminalization can be done through like electoral or like legislative work where we say, okay, well now prostitution is no longer a crime and that that would be decriminalization, but that's not enough because we know, and we've talked about this, Aline's talked about this, Esther has talked about this, is that prostitution charges, like, like these sex work charges are not the only ways in which people are criminalized for doing sex work, are not the only ways that people are criminalized for being Asian migrant women, right? That this violence is wholly racialized and gendered, and they find so many different ways to arrest people, to criminalize people, to enact this violence on people, whatever that may be, right? Whether it be hygiene laws, whether it be licensure, right? So the only way that you're ever going to actually have full decriminalization of sex work and have decrim in general is to have full abolition of the police and prisons. Because if there's police, they will police you, right? If there are social workers, they will social work. If we have prisons, they will fill them. Thank you so much. I, um, I perhaps I just want to make one point of clarification because sometimes in talking about sex work, um, some people will use abolitionism um, and abolitionist feminism to refer to that strand of feminism that actually wants to get rid of sex work altogether, abolish prostitution. And you are, we are very explicitly, and you are very explicitly referring to the prison, uh, the prison and police abolitionist movement, right? Or the abolition of prison and, and, and police uh, in that sense. So we, we need to also make sure that we, you know, alert people to that difference. Um, sometimes um, I know language gets caught up here, but it's just, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, I'm going to move on to the last question for all of you um, so that we can also turn to some of the questions that are coming in from the audience. Um, so just briefly, what is one thing, and we can just go around in a circle, what is one thing you wish that the current discussion, um, would, that you'd like to hear and talk about that the current discussion leaves out? What is that? So I, I think now the anti-racism like um, thing is so important and, and so loud, but I think that we also need to acknowledge the class within the Asian community, the, the gender, the, 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 the race, and particularly the homophobia. So when we talk about the inference of the questionality, 
So we see actually so many powerful uh, people from Asian community, they are also questioned because of whole colonization uh, process. And then the white supremacy is still um, carry out and push uh, by them, right? And then the whole phobia within the Asian community, that is something we also need to work on, you know, to, 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 to uh, push back. And so, and then the real solidarity cannot be built if the anti-racism work do not have the allyship with the sex worker movement, do not have like uh, the allyship with the Black Lives Matter movement, do not have the allyship with the migrant movement, that is not the real anti-racism movement. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you so much. Esther Wu? Um, I'm going to take Wu, invite Wu to. Um, yeah, I think that everything that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I think that in addition to everything that um, other people have said, uh, I would just like to echo Eve's points on on abolition and like how there has been like an increase in, in policing that have that has like come in in the in the wake of like all the tragedies that occurred last week. Um, and that like a lot of like really, really loud voices and a lot of like, um, like Elena mentioned, like at the intersection of like um, class and race, there are different sects of Asian American community that want to protect their community and that want to like bring in more policing um, in, in a kind of like, I guess like effort and um, vote for like respectability as well as like to gain proximity to like right, white supremacy. And it's just like important to note that like the police are never going to protect a marginalized community. Um, and also to note that like when a police officer attempts to protect somebody within like a higher class, even if they're of a different race, that they do not see you as like someone of that race. They see you as someone of that class. And that is like a really crucial distinction to be making. So um, yeah, the police are not going to be protecting that community because it's an Asian American community. They're going to be protecting that community because it's wealthy or because it's closer to whiteness. Um, and so pushing for like um, distancing from policing and defunding of policing um, and prison abolition in general is like super crucial. Fantastic. Esther? I honestly feel like all of the big points have been touched up, uh, upon. Um, um, I guess um, if there's any takeaways, it's I would really encourage people to get organized in their local communities, right? I think there's a lot of questions about how do I get plugged in? How do I help out? Um, and this is the best way, you know, you get involved in your local organizing community to build power and to work from the ground up. Um, you know, donations are great, like, but that's, that's a bandage on the, the real, like, cancer that is um, in this country. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I think that's a I hope everyone does, you know, um, support their local organizing groups. And Eves, your final, your last one thing that you think the current discussion leaves out. I mean, I think I echo everybody's feelings and concerns. Um, there are so many intersections for which this issue occurs. And I really want to like underscore that and, you know, really highlight what Eileen said is that this issue has to do with not only race, but also gender, but also class and also immigration status. And we can't remove any of those parts. And also when there's so much specificity around this issue and you need to have the specificity in your conversations and discussions around it, right? I often see people talking about what happened in Atlanta and in general anti-Asian violence, especially from the Asian community around like feeling either that 
they have experienced it or otherwise, right? The calls to action for specific demands that would harm massage workers, that would harm the most vulnerable people in our communities. And that's partially because there's so much specificity to talking about it that people miss, right? If you're an upper class Asian woman, you are not experiencing the violence that the women in Atlanta are experiencing. You're not experiencing the violence that massage workers or sex workers on the street are experiencing. And there needs to be specificity and also the solutions that you might think are solutions are not going to be it. And so you have to really listen to the most vulnerable people in our community, which would be massage workers, Asian migrant workers, which would be sex workers and those who are criminalized. Exactly, yes, yeah, that's really helpful. I mean, one of the questions that came, I'm just gonna go straight into the, some of the questions that have come in. Thank you for your comments from the audience and, uh, and appreciations and, and some questions that we have. But one of them actually picks up, I think, on what all of you've just been saying, but perhaps you could drill down a little bit more on that and in terms of what resources do organizations such as yours, such as Red Canary Song and Butterfly need to continue and expand the work? Um, which you've all hinted at, um, but perhaps there's something you'd like to add right now. Or is there? <laughs> Eve and uh, Elaine, I think you'd be the ones to speak to that. Yeah, and I think that, uh, of course, like we receive a lot, a lot of donation. It's unbelievable. That is something really appreciate. But I think in addition to that, um, share your message and, and continues to mobilize and continues to have the critical understanding of this issue and really support the advocate of the policy because we know that the, I don't call it abolitionist. That is um, uh, Kamala told me many years ago. So I call it anti-sex worker organization. It's more clear they're anti-sex worker. So, and, and then they allow, they are powerful, they are organized. So that's why we really need the support, particularly people in different positions, share your power, share your resources to support the sex worker movement. And, 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 and I think also build the solidarity, right? So that uh, we are in different city, different country, but we are working together and share the knowledge and, and build the solidarity. And we also need uh, different people, um, the audience uh, participant here and, uh, I, I just think that if one people can mobilize 10 people, we will much more, more powerful. Like don't hesitate and don't, um, and, but in your messaging, make sure you're informed by the sex worker and sex worker organization. So that I think this is also important in your advocacy work. Otherwise we'll do a lot of harm also. Thank you. Yeah, that's so, so, so important. And so important why you're here today as well to tell us these things. Um, even Esther? Do you want to add anything about what Red Canary um, song might also need in going forward? Sure. Other, so, than, other than the kind of organizing work that uh, is so, so, so critical and the mobilizing that we have to keep doing. Yeah, I mean, I echo the same feelings. I think we all do that the donations, the money is welcome and we really appreciate it. Um, especially right now, this is money we've never seen before, which absolutely does affect the work, allows us to do things that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to do, which I think Esther mentioned is that we stopped giving cash aid and we want to continue to give cash aid, right, which this allows us to do. So the money is always welcome. But in that being also said is that the positions that we take are actually not that popular, that there aren't that many people out there who are supporting us and the people who are doing the work. There are very few of us that actually, quite frankly, right, as far as the like Americas are concerned, most of the people who are doing this organizing work are sitting here on this Zoom with a couple people like not here, right? So I feel like you always need more people to do the work. And we've highlighted this a lot in talking to the media over the past week, but we can't just stop doing it once this is no longer in the news cycle. You can't just stop talking about it and not caring about it. And Esther also talked about this, that you should really plug into the work. And if it doesn't exist, then you should start it, right? Whether that means that you're going to create mutual aid networks and you should support the people in your community, you should support the sex workers in your community, you should support the migrant workers and massage workers in your community because they exist everywhere. In every city, in every country, there are massage workers, there are Asian migrant workers, I promise you, right? And they need your support. 
And then beyond that, right, in organizing, there are people who in need everywhere. And if the work doesn't currently exist, if you don't live in New York City and you can't join Red Canary, if you don't live in Toronto and you can't join Butterfly, you should start the work if you're a part of the community, right? You should support people in that way. Um, and that's really what I feel like it comes down to. Whew, thank you. Um, I'm gonna draw from another question uh, in, in the chat um, that I think it would be helpful for, to hear from as many people who want to, to answer it. Um, when people say massage parlor, is that coded language for a particular kind of sex work or do massage parlor workers seek a delineation or distancing from sex work? This person also asked, those killed deserve honor and respect regardless, but I have seen in the coverage of the events in Atlanta, people contesting that the victims of violence were or were not sex workers, as if that somehow lessens the impact. And I am confused about the connection and how to support both. Um, I might turn it over to Elaine first and talk about the massage parlor question. And, then... yeah, and I think this is, to be honest, this is also the struggle of our, the beginning of our organizing because the homophobia, the discrimination, not only outside the sex worker and massage parlor community, but also inside the community, right? So as I said before, in massage parlor, some people do sex work, some people may not do sex work, and the, the level or type of service is so different and we it's not so different difficult to hear that many workers actually provide hand job service do not think that they are providing sexual service right so and i think that is also a lot of tension within the community how they want to identify and particularly um, when we do a lot of lobbying and a lot of advocacy work um, they want to divide us, right? So it's not so common when we lobby the city hall, they will say, I'm trying to catch the bad apple because of the bad apple that is police, the ray is coming. So to blaming and divide the community. And that is the challenge what we have faced, particularly at the very beginning. But I think um, taking more time and then we have like um, more work and, and have more dialogue within the community is very, very clear that no matter what kind of service people provide, they have the right to decide what service they want to provide. And no matter what type of service they provide, they deserve right and dignity and respect. And then how the homophobia and the discrimination against the sex worker actually make many worker cannot be identified as that don't want to be identified or they don't identify themselves. So, and I think that instead of putting a lot of effort to differentiate who provide what kind of services, whether they are sex worker or not, we need to eliminate the discrimination and we need to, then we can respect whatever people, how to call themselves or not calling themselves. And I think that is more important issue we need to um, uh, uh, address. And I think often asking this question is always have a lot of assumption. I still remember when we advocate the rights in massage parlor of the worker, even the very progressive um, um, politician, so that we say like the worker is being abused by the law enforcement. The first question is not what kind of abuse they're facing. It's like, what kind of service are they providing? Are they provide massage service or they provide sexual service? So that implies what kind of rights they deserve, right? So that if the people is sex worker, they often being seen as not deserved and then they do not get so much support. And I think that we need to break the wall. So that no matter people do sex work or massage that we are still the um, community, we need to um, advocate together. And in reality, the service is also very fluid, right? Like people may have different time, provide different kind of service, even same person to different client may have different kind of service. And I think we should not eager to um, draw the line is we need to draw the solidarity and, and push back the whole phobia. Yeah. yeah, I think um, that uh, point about pushing it back against the whole phobia, or brutophobia, some people will call it, you know, is so, so critical here because it's not necessarily how you identify, but it's about that stigma that attaches to the massage parlor. 
that is so so you know destructive and dangerous and harmful to a lot of people um, in many ways. So thank you for that. Um, there's a question that I think we should uh, um, uh, take here. It's from Elaine Congress, and she says, thanks very much for raising my consciousness and making me more aware of issues that I did not fully understand. I'm not a sex worker, but I'm fully in support of women's right to choose to do the work she wants to. I do have a, a, li a lingering concern, however. Aren't there some women, especially Asians, who are sex trafficked, I think that's what she means, so are, I think she's saying, are unable to choose their profession? Or is it that just the propaganda of the anti-sex workers campaign? Um, uh, I would like to take this question. So um, I think that there is a lot of, and this I think also uh, pulls from the last question as well. I think that there's like a, a sense of um, morality that, that is implied with like a certain amount of like interiority or proximity to the body when it comes to um, how things are like codified into law. So it is interesting to acknowledge like, okay, there are people in this country who are operating under jobs, whether they are immigrants in this country or whether they are poor or whether they are um, people of color or like whatever circumstances it is that they have that are working within a job that they do not like um, or working within a job that doesn't necessarily like spiritually fulfill them, right? Um, and I think that uh, it is important to acknowledge that like literally all labor is forced labor because it is operating under a system that like requires that we work in order to be able to survive. So um, it is interesting to note that like there is a specific rhetoric around the use of the term trafficking, especially sex trafficking, because it implies that there is a different type of exploitation that is going on when somebody attempts to use their body for labor. Um, and I think that that is like a kind of like moralistic implication that applies to massage work, it applies to sex work, it applies to other racialized types of work like um, nail, uh, nail salon techs um, are also people who are like subject to that kind of racialization. Um, and it's just really important to notice that like, that is a specific uh, kind of rhetoric that's not necessarily applied to other types of labor such as like restaurant labor or like other low wage labor like garment work or um, or yeah, or like day labor, for example. Um, and um, it's also important to acknowledge the fact that like a lot of that narrative um, around sex trafficking, around sex trafficking or that anti-trafficking organizations use increases the amount of policing within like a specific community. And that it actually like does a lot more harm and delves into a lot of the savior complexes that Esther mentioned um, that then provide, um, I guess, like ample justification for um, things like law enforcement, for social services to come into that community and then ravage that community instead of like acknowledging that there's a certain amount of like, you know, agency or, or autonomy that somebody might have when they're choosing to do whatever kind of labor it is that they want to do. Um, I think that it is important also to acknowledge that there are some people who do not have a choice in the kind of labor that they, that they are um, engaging in or performing but that those numbers are off, often very, very inflated when it comes to the people who are operating within massage parlor industries or sex industries or any other kind of like racialized industry. Um, if anybody else wants to jump in. If I may, unless anybody else wants to go. Um, I do want to note like human trafficking as we like know it isn't something that is made up, right? It's something that definitely does happen, but this is also a part of the conversation as to like what the solution to that is, which I'll tell you is that a part of the problem with human trafficking and how we deal with it is that a, they're still criminalizing people. When you're criminalizing people, if someone is trafficked and they want help or they want to leave doing this work, right? Whatever that may be, which Wu brings up, could be anything from working in a nail salon to working in a massage business to working on a farm, right? A lot of people are a part of this conversation as to what like trafficking might be. If they wanna leave the work, 
they're not going to be able to do it at this exact moment in time because they're being criminalized. If they seek out help, they'll tell you that we're going to arrest you because you've been trafficked. Often people are arrested and charged for trafficking themselves. And people who employ undocumented workers under the table are often also arrested for trafficking for employing undocumented people, right? So we know that criminalization is a part of the issue, right? So I'm not going to sit here and say that trafficking isn't a thing that happens because it does, but also happens for a lot of conditions, right? Very specific conditions that occur globally as to why trafficking even happens in the first place that I don't think that a lot of anti-trafficking groups actually have the nuance to talk about, but that it is a thing that happens, but the groups that are anti-trafficking groups are telling you that the solution is through criminalization, are telling you that the solution is through this rescue, but it's not. And we know that if we, people wanted to leave, they wouldn't be able to do it right now and that they wouldn't be able to seek out social services, that they're further criminalized and further driven underground when they seek out help. Yeah, and I, I think here have so many people have so much um, knowledge and um, about like um, the the problem of this term of human trafficking. But I think we keep thinking, what is human trafficking? People seems that they know it, but no one knows about it, because the human trafficking the term is so powerful. They can cover up policing. They can cover up more agenda. They can cover up the anti sex work intention. But when you talk about human trafficking, what do you talk about? Do you talk about the domestic violence, the boyfriend not working, the woman working, they take all the money? Or you talk about the woman being locked down and forced to work in sex industry? Or the woman put in the luggage and bring, bring to US or Canada? But human trafficking actually do not tell anything. But they are using the illusion that is also using the myth that is all create the image that is like extremely violent to justify what when you see the arrest of human trafficking, it's not human trafficking. The rate of human trafficking is just sex work, right? Or sex worker work with other people. And that's why it's so powerful when we talk about trafficking, we don't know what it's talking about. Is it talking about labor exploitation, the work, the, 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 the boss not paying the worker or like having very bad working condition, right? And I think that the violence as um, Eve said, happen anywhere, like exploitation happen anywhere. We know the solution. Police is not the solution. So for the domestic violence, so many wife is being beaten up by the husband. We do not call for criminalized marriage. Actually, more people being murdered or harmed in marriage than sex industry, right? We do not say criminalization of the husband when there is there are so many men, husband is the perpetrator, right? So, and I think how, all this thing behind is the moralistic idea and support like policing, support racism, support like anti-sex work. So that's why I think um, as Kamala keeps saying that we need to get rid of this term because this term do not help us to, to see anything, but they are powerful to make us kind of see what actually happened. And I think that is something we need to keep um, advocating, yeah. Okay, we're reaching the end of our time okay. together and there are a number of um, questions in the chat that have asked about how to get involved in Providence. Um, so I want to say um, there's no way we can, maybe we can have a separate webinar that speaks specifically to issues and things that we've been working on Providence. Feel free um, to email myself if you'd like to get involved with the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice Human Trafficking Research Cluster. Additionally, Coyote Rhode Island and Ocean State Ass are two organizations that are working locally and I'm going to share um, some of their contact information. But really to close us out um, for, for such a really uh, charged session, uh, today, I want to turn it over to um, Eves. I mean, I want to turn it over to Wu. Sorry. Um, and I want to ask Wu, what are your suggestions, insights, revelations as a, a cultural worker, artist, and healer mm. of different productive ways that we might pursue individual, group, community healing moving forward? Um, 
this is going to sound very woo woo of me, which is very funny considering my name. Um, so uh, there is something that I think that is like really important to acknowledge with the value um, in as much as like value is all fake in as much as like, um, you know, all labor is <laughs> theoretically worthless. I think that there is something to acknowledge about like the value of things like sex work, about massage work, about nail um, parlor work. Um, which is that like all of them in some way, shape or form are contributing, are like seen as lu luxury goods, right? Um, but in reality, all of them are services that contribute embodied experiences back to the physical, the physical like being and embodiment, right? So I think that there is like a certain amount of um, really intense like disembodied sensations that we have been participating in, especially over the course of the past year. Um, and I think that like artwork, cultural work, um, we're speaking on like a panel at Brown, which is a uh, Ivy League University also has a fantastic humanities program. Um, and also Rhode Island has like another fantastic school, Rhode, Rhode Island School of Design. So um, anything having to do with like the arts is like the, the important part about that is like acknowledging that there is like this central experience, right? That there's a central like human experience that speaks to the human condition and that there's something in like in these embodied experiences such as like sex work, such as like receiving a massage and just like having, you know, having all of the stress of the entire week just pounded out of you um, that like returns you to like a central place. And I think that that is something that like artwork can do as well. It can like convey the sense of like being trapped or being scared or being fearful or being liberated. Um, and that's something that you can do either as like an individual practice as like on your own, creating an altar, creating a space in which like you are focused on you and your embodied experience on your own, or it's something that you can seek a provider to do, whether that's hiring a sex worker, um, hiring a massage worker, tipping those sex workers and those massage workers, um, tipping those like um, nail salon workers, tipping the people at the restaurant um, and trading that energy in that way. And that's also something that you can do and like an experience that you can have when you organize with other people. And I think that that's like, that's something that's like really crucial that I've found to be this like, um, to be this like central energy, like this sort of like holy trinity between um, sex work art and activism. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so dearly to all of our panelists. I hope that all of our audience members find ways to continue to tap into your incredible work. I want to end maybe with one difficult paradox and provocation that we can all sit with. And that is that most of the massage workers that I have talked to in the past couple of days are concerned about how much attention the mass murders of last week have gotten, particularly because it has meant the increase of more surveillance, ironically, on them, even as people want to, to help, they want um, to alleviate some of the burdens that they're beginning to see. Inevitably, everything that we do to cast more attention to this issue inevitably sometimes does enact more harm on these communities. And so what is it that we can do to take these lessons and to share with other people that doesn't bring more unintentional just eyes um, on this particular kind of already heavily policed and surveilled work? I look forward to hearing those answers from all of you. And thank you all for um, sharing the time with us today. Thank you, Elena. Thank you for organizing. Great to see all of you, learn, learn from all of you. Thank you to our translators, to our incredible media team um, at Watson, the CSSJ, and the co-sponsors in departments of East Asian Studies, History, and the China Initiative at the Watson Institute. On behalf of Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, we are signing off. Bye-bye. <laughs>